Uh, thank you, Jitu, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, organizers of the Microscopy course, for having me yet again uh, for this inaugural lecture. So, what I want to do today is to take you through the history of optics and microscopy, and in that process, tell you a little bit about basics of microscopy. Now, understanding optics and microscopy requires us to understand a little bit of physics. As Sheldon rightly pointed out, our journey in physics probably started in the agoras of ancient Greece. The philosophers and thinkers of that time looked up at the night sky and they wondered how some of these celestial bodies move. So how things move was something that interested them. And this is a branch of physics that is called mechanics. They also looked up and wondered how these celestial bodies produce light and more importantly, what is light. And this is a branch of physics that deals with optics. So mechanics and optics were probably the first branches of physics. Mechanics was easier to study because you could drop a stone or make one object hit another or roll a wheel. You can think of hundreds of experiments in mechanics, but studying optics was very difficult because you cannot touch, feel, or handle light where you handle objects. So then how do you study optics? You study optics by studying the interaction of light with matter. And there are various different ways in which this happened. And the most simplest way is reflection. Reflection happens when light interacts with a very smooth surface, as you can see here on this uh, still lake. And reflection follows a very simple principle, which says angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. Now this is something most of you might know. What you might not know is who discovered the law of reflection. It is believed that it was Archimedes who discovered the law of reflection. So he discovers the law of reflection, he builds really high quality mirrors, and then he puts these mirrors to really good use. So it is believed when uh, Greece was attacked by Rome, uh, using a flotilla of uh, naval ships, Archimedes built this uh, giant concave mirror using a series of plane mirrors. Then he focused sunlight and burned the ships. Now, uh, we don't really know whether he really managed to burn the ships, but he might have managed to confuse or uh, frighten the enemy. Now, there is something really interesting here. These mirrors, if you observe carefully, are not held on pillars or posts. They are held by humans, most likely soldiers. So that means they can move the mirrors. And this gives them uh, two advantages. First, they can lock the focal spot onto the target, which is a naval ship here. Second, they can make sure that this focal spot is as small as possible to maximize the intensity at that spot and thereby maximizing damage. In modern terms, this is called adaptive optics. So the sensory input received by the soldiers is processed by their brains to create a feedback, which then moves the mirrors to minimize the focal spot, which is exactly what adaptive optics, uh, the modern day adaptive optics is trying to achieve. Now, more than 2,300 2, years later, we are using the exactly the same principle to build some of the world's most sophisticated optical instruments. For example, the European Extremely Large Telescope, which is under construction. So this telescope is essentially a very large concave mirror built out of hundreds of uh, smaller hexagonal shaped plane mirrors. Each mirror can be gimbaled following a feedback which tries to provide the effective concave mirror as small a focal spot as possible. So this is exactly what Archimedes was trying to do. Now, the, uh, there's something I want to point out here. Optical systems are broadly classified into two categories, telescopes and microscopes. Telescopes like these use reflective optics, whereas microscopes mostly use refractive optics. That means we should know about refraction. 
Now, refraction is an interface effect. It happens when light travels from a medium of one refractive index into another medium of a different refractive index. So, if light travels from a medium of lower refractive index into a medium of higher refractive index, the light bends towards the normal. Similarly, if the light is traveling from a medium of higher refractive index into a medium of lower refractive index, the light bends away from the normal. And this can be described uh, by what is called as a Snell's law. The Snell's law says that n1 sine phi i is equal to n2 sine phi r, where n1 and n2 are the refractive indices, phi i is the angle of incidence and phi r is the angle of refraction. So if n2 is greater than n1, then phi r is less than phi i, which is what we are seeing here. Now Snell's law is attributed to a Dutch astronomer and mathematician called Snellius, but Snell's law itself was known at least 500 years before Snell. So who discovered Snell's law? We will look at some possibilities later in this presentation. Now I want to take you to a remote village in Philippines where this man will tell us how to use refraction and how to put refraction to good use. He's not a famous personality like uh, Sheldon Cooper or Archimedes, but in his village, they call him the solar god. So let's hear what he has to tell us and please make sure you uh, read the subtitle. Isempre alam mo na mga ganito ng lugar is water area, tabing rilis, dikit-dikit ang bahay. Madilim talaga rito sa lugar ko na tao. Wala kami dito sa loob, lagi kami sa labas. Nadadapa kasi madilim, nadadaan mo hindi mo alam may nakaharang. Tutulog na lang ako, lainaw eh. Ang tawag niyo sa akin dito is si Mang Dimi Solar. Napaliwanag ko yung mga bahay niya na madilim. Bubutas ka ng yero, lalagay mo yung buti. Lagyan mo siya ng silan, bago lagyan mo siya ng tubig na mineral, lalagyan ng sunrocks. Bago kabit mo sa bahay, lagyan mo silan to para hindi tumulo. Ganyan lang ang kasimple yun. Dati yung ganyan ito kadilim nung bago ko pagkakapitan. Ngayon nung kapitan mo na, ito na ang liwanag niya. Ngayon ang liwanag. Umilip po ako kasi bote lang, tubig, maliwanag na yung bahay mo. So what was demonstrated in this video was probably obvious, but some of you might have had a question. Um, they cut a hole on the roof, right? So why not leave a sheet of transparent glass or plastic to let the light through? What difference did sticking a bottle full of water through that hole make? The answer is actually two words, numeric lapocha. Without the bottle, the light collected by the hole is whatever comes straight down. But with the bottle in, you see the top of the bottle has this conical shape because of which it acts like a lens, which increases the effective numerical aperture of the system. That means the system collects light at a much wider cone. So, so much more light is collected into the hole compared to the situation when there is no bottle. There is something else that happens. As the light travels through the bottle, it interacts with water not so pure water. So the light gets scattered all around the room. So you have now this nice flow of light from outside into the bottle and then all around the room, really simulating the effect of a light bulb. So this is a light bulb. This is a bottle filled with water sticking through the room. So when I was looking at examples uh, to put refraction and scattering to good use, I could not find a better example. Now, this is also telling us a thing or two about how to make a lens. Now, again, if you look at the top portion of this bottle, there are a couple of things you can observe. First is the refractive index. The refractive index of water and plastic is higher than the surroundings. So this is one of the conditions you have to meet if you want to make a focusing lens. Second thing you would observe is the conical shape. 
it has a gradient to its thickness. The point I want to make is, if you have a slab of glass or a slab of plastic, you can refract light, but you cannot focus light. To focus light, you need a shape with some kind of a gradient to its thickness. And the most commonly used shape for a lens, for a focusing lens, is the biconvex shape. This now brings us to a very interesting question. Why is a lens called a lens? A lens is called a lens because of its shape. The shape resembles a lentil bean. So the lens gets its name from lentil. Now, if you're not con uh, convinced, the scientific name of uh, lentils is lens culinaris. So that is where lens gets its name from. Okay, now let's take a look at how a lens works. If I send in a parallel beam of light into a lens, the light gets focused at a point, which is called the focus point or the focus. And the distance between the focal point and the lens is called the focal length. Similarly, if I have a point source of light kept at the focal point, so I have a point source of light sitting here, light is radiated isotropically in all directions, a cone of light is intercepted by the lens, then the light will come out collimated. So you can trace the light forward and in the backward direction if you have a simple system like a biconvex lens. Now there is something interesting about a lens. As you move, interesting about a biconvex lens, as you move from the center to the periphery, the thickness of the lens decreases, right? But if you look at the light that transmits through, you see that as the thickness decreases, the bending of the light increases. In fact, at the thickest portion of the lens, exactly at the center, there is absolutely no bending of the light. The light passes straight through. And as you travel up, light start bending more and more. And the maximum amount of bending is produced at the thinnest uh, section of the lens. Now, this might be a little bit counterintuitive. Some of you might have thought that uh, a thicker lens or a thicker piece of glass would uh, introduce more refraction compared to a thinner piece of glass. But now if you look at the Snell's law, you will see that the Snell's law doesn't talk about thickness. The Snell's law only talks about the refractive index change and the angle of incidence. It does not talk about thickness. So refraction is independent of thickness. Let's take a more closer look. A convex lens has two interfaces, an air glass interface and a glass air interface. Now let's impinge a light ray exactly at the center of this lens. Exactly at the center, what is the angle of incidence? Angle of incidence, you can observe, is zero. If the angle of incidence is zero, then angle of refraction is zero, which means the light passes straight through, reaches the second interface, and at the second interface, again, angle of incidence is zero, so angle of refraction is zero. That is why a light striking the center of the lens will pass through the lens undeviated. Let's move a little bit up. At this point, the angle of incidence is a finite value. It's no longer zero. Light is traveling from air into glass, so it will bend towards the normal. It reaches the second interface. At this interface, light is traveling from glass into air. It will bend away from the normal, and the net result is light is bending towards the optic axis to intersect the optic, optic axis at this point, which is the focal point. Now let's move a little bit further up. So at this point, the angle of incidence is substantially higher than what we had here which means the refraction is higher and subsequently the bending of light is much higher than the bending of light at this point. Light bends down and again passes through the same point, the focal point. So what does this convex shape offer us? The convex shape is offering us a system that progressively increases the angle of incidence, thereby progressively increasing the bending of light 
with the effective with the goal of bringing all the light to one point the focal point now there are a couple of things that you want to keep in mind <clears throat> at the first interface light is traveling from a rarer medium to a denser medium from air to glass and light bends towards the normal at the second interface light is traveling from a denser medium into a rarer medium from glass to air and the light is bending away from the normal but in both cases light is bending towards the optic axis and this is the unique geometry that the biconvex lens is opting on <clears throat> now let's take a look at few more situations here i have a lens here and i have marked the focal length as f and the twice the focal length as 2f and i have marked it on both sides of the lens so f and f here 2f and 2f here if i have an object at infinity the light is coming in parallel and obviously it will focus at the focal point now let's assume i am this object and initially i was standing at infinity and i'm slowly walking towards the lens at some point i reach a point between infinity and 2f so what happens to my image my image is formed on the other side of the lens what else can we say about my image my image is formed between f and 2f the image is inverted and the size of the image is smaller than me which means it is a demagnified image there is no magnification i keep walking forward i reach 2f at this point my image is formed exactly as 2f the size of the image is exactly as that of me which means magnification is 1 i keep walking forward i reach a point between 2f and f now at this point my image is formed between 2f and infinity on the other side of the lens and my image is magnified now this is a condition that you might want to keep in mind because this is a condition that we can use to create a microscope because this condition creates a magnified image now as i keep walking forward and as i reach closer and closer to f my image gets further and further away from 2f and as my image gets further and further from 2f the image gets more and more magnified so the closer i get to f more is the magnification and at some point i reach f where the magnification is infinity which essentially means light is coming out parallel and it will only meet at infinity i can keep walking forward i reach a distance that is smaller than the focal length of the lens and at this point the convex lens is not behaving as a convex lens it is behaving more like a concave lens the light is coming out diverging and we say we have a virtual image <clears throat> now this description of light matter interaction considering light as a bundle of rays is called geometric optics geometric optics uses concepts in geometry and trigonometry to describe how light interacts with optical elements and geometric optics is a very old field the first books in geometric optics were published more than 1000 years ago in fact one of the notable ones one of the first among the notable book in optics was called the kitab al harakat so this was uh, written in arabic kitab al harakat means the book of burning mirrors and glasses and this was written in ad 984 and this was written by ibn shal who was a mathematician physicist and optics engineer uh, in the court of baghdad and in this book he describes a convex lens as part of a sphere and what you are seeing here is actually the snell's law now let's assume we have this interface with two refractive indices n1 and n2 ab is my incident ray bc is the refracted ray and if i retrace or back trace the refracted ray i get bd and using simple trigonometry i can write sin theta 1 by sin theta 2 as bd by ab which is nothing but n2 by n1 
and this is the first known description of snail frog so many um, science historians believe that snail frog was actually discovered by ibn shar almost 500 years before uh, snail was born however one uh, the most influential book on ep optics ever written is considered to be kitab al manazir or the book of optics this was written by hasan bin al hayatam who is uh, more uh, famously known as al hasan and kitab al manazir is a treatise with seven volumes the treatise describes uh, the theory of light colors reflection uh, reflection and refraction um, al hasan also references several previous works including that of ibn shal and he also develops a very detailed theory of vision which is very similar to our current understanding of vision kitab al manasir was uh, translated into latin several hundred years later and uh, then it was called as a book of optics by al hasan and this was a time when optics was being studied uh, more seriously in europe and this book probably acted as a reference now we know a little bit about lenses we know how lenses work now we need to understand how we can put lenses together to create an imaging system before that we need to understand what is imaging so let's assume i have an object and i want to create an image of the object what can i do i can uh, uh so my goal is to have this object and create an image of this object on the screen what i can do is i can bombard this object with some probes what are these probes these probes can be electrons ions photons depending on what probes i use i call it uh, electron imaging ion imaging or optical imaging these probes are scattered by the object and i can collect these probes on the screen now does this create an image it does not so simply collecting scattered probes alone does not create an image why is that so this because if i take a particular point on the screen um the probes falling on this screen this point has contributions from almost every point on this object so there is nothing unique about the probes falling on a particular point on the screen so what you end up having is a smear of intensity but no image one way to remedy this uh, situation is by putting a pinhole what this pinhole does is it blocks most of the probes from reaching the screen but now you can see that the probes reaching the point a dash is predominantly coming from point a the probes reaching point b is predominantly coming from point b and probes reaching point c dash is predominantly coming from point c so the probes have a greater definition to uh, where they are falling so this creates an imaging system you can start forming an image of the object and this kind of an arrangement is called a pinhole camera or a camera obscura so the pinhole camera is probably the earliest imaging system and probably the simplest of all pinhole cameras were extensively used even like 20 years ago for indoor photography and it is believed that the first pinhole camera was set up by al hasan so al hasan would entertain the citizens of the city of basra by projecting an image of the palace of basra in a dark room with a small hole uh, on the window so this small hole would act as a pinhole camera so as a optical system this is a very simple and elegant design but there is a drawback the drawback is to get a sharp image you have to close down the pinhole and when you close down the pinhole it blocks the light and then very little uh, probes reach the detector it's not a very efficient system so what we really need to do is replace the pinhole with some kind of a collector what would this collector do the collector's job would be to collect probes scattered by point a and project it to a unique point a dash collect the probes scattered by point b and project it to a unique point b dash and similarly the probes scattered by point c to a unique point c dash 
So if you have a system like this, it will help create an image with minimal loss in, uh, in the probes or loss of probes. So what does the collector do? The collector maps the probes from a point on the object to a unique point on the screen. So that means imaging is nothing but a process of mapping. Mapping the points from the object plane onto the image plane. So this is what imaging is all about. Map the points from the object plane onto the image plane using some kind of a collection system. Now, if my probes are photons and the collection system is a lens or a combination of lenses, we call this optical imaging. And that is what we need to look at in greater detail. The first optical system using lenses were ob obviously spectacles. And uh, the initial microscope manufacturers were also spectacle makers. Spectacles uh, do not really magnify the image. And the simplest magnifying system is a magnifying glass. So how does a magnifying glass work? So I have a single lens. I keep the object between F and the lens. So I'm keeping the object at a distance shorter than the focal length of the lens. What happens then? We have seen this situation before. The light comes out diverging. So it does not create a real image. It creates a virtual image. But then I can introduce another lens. This time it is a lens of my eye. So the lens of my eye takes this virtual image and converts it into a real image. So the image of this point is projected onto the retina as a real image. And the observer would then see a real, sorry, a real erect image on the same side of the lens. And this is how magnifying lenses work. Now a magnifying lens, even though it magnifies, it is not really considered to be a microscope. So what is microscope? Or uh, let's take a look at this word microscopy. So microscopy means it comes from two Greek words, micros means small, and scopian means to observe. So microscopy means to observe small objects. The simplest microscope is what is called as a finite tube, tube length microscope. It's all about where you keep the object with respect to the lens. So in a finite tube length microscope, the object is kept between 2F and F. And we have seen this condition before. If you have the object between 2F and F, a magnified image is formed between 2F and infinity. And this is the simplest way to create a magnified image. Now, it might be interesting to measure what is the magnification of a system like this. So how do you define magnification? So the height of my object is H, height of my image is H dash. So magnification is nothing but H dash by H. And now if I look at these two triangles shaded in light blue, these two triangles are similar triangles. And from the property of similar triangles, we can say that H dash by H is nothing but D, which is the distance of the image from the lens divided by A, which is the distance of the object from the lens. So magnification for a finite tube length microscope is distance of the image from the lens divided by distance of the object from the lens. So if you want to capture this image on a screen, I can put a screen there or I can put a camera sensor here, in which case I can capture this image on a computer screen, for example. But if you have to see this image through the eyepiece, then there is an additional complication because my eye introduces an additional lens. So what I need to do now is to introduce a third lens, which is called the eyepiece. The eyepiece is placed exactly at its focal distance from this point where image is formed. And the eyepiece and the eye act together to relay the image of this point onto the retina. So this enables my eye to see the image. Now the finite tube length microscope the distance between the objective and the eyepiece is called the tube length. And once you have fixed the magnification of the system, this tube length remains same. I mean, you cannot change this tube length. 
And this created some complications in initial microscopic design and there were some other problems as well. So modern microscope do not use the finite tube length configuration. Modern microscopes use what is called as an infinite tube length configuration. So what happens in infinite tube length configuration? You have the object and this object is placed exactly at focal distance away from the objective. And we have seen this condition before. If this happens, the light comes out collimated and image is not formed. So I have to introduce an additional lens. This additional lens is called a tube lens or an intermediate lens. And the intermediate lens will form an image at its focal point. So I have my image formed here. Now, the distance between the objective and the intermediate lens is called an infinite space because the light from the different points on the object come out as bundles of parallel beams, which essentially, or the at least theoretically means I have an infinite space between my objective lens and the tube lens. So in this situation, in, when you have an infinite tube length configuration, what is my magnification? So magnification from our previous definition was distance of the image from the lens, which in this case is the focal length of the tube lens. Distance of the image from the lens is nothing but the focal length of the tube lens. And distance of the object from the lens is nothing but the focal length of the objective. So my magnification is nothing but focal length of tube lens divided by focal length of the object. And this is a magnification for an infinite tube length configuration. This makes again microscope design easier for a microscope designer. Again, if you want to capture the image on a screen or a camera, I can put the camera sensor on this plane, which is called as an intermediate image plane. And if you want to observe, or the image through the eyepiece. I will have to introduce the eyepiece and observe the image uh, through my eye. So this is a four lens system. There are four lenses involved. You have the objective lens, the tube lens, the eyepiece, and finally the lens of the eye, which together act to image uh, the object onto the retina. Now, we might want to address a question here. Can I have a question? Sure, sure. Please I was go ahead. On, I, sorry, I was wondering, um, does the microscope or the user see the image inverted or normal according to the scheme? Uh, so I believe this will be inverted. For the user or the microscope? For the microscope. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't know if I'm... Uh, making a mistake here. I believe so. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, the question I wanted to address was, um, yeah. So if the magnification of my system is focal length of tube lens divided by focal length of the objective, what does it mean when a company like Carl Zeiss says that this objective has a magnification of 63 X because the magnification of the microscope cannot be uniquely defined by the objective, right? So what this actually means is this objective is matched to a very specific tube lens, which is present in the microscope for which this objective was designed. So every objective is matched to a specific tube lens in an infinity corrected microscope design. So you have to be careful if you want, if you are trying to use a Zeiss microscope on a, sorry, Zeiss objective on a Nikon microscope or a uh, Nikon objective on an Olympus microscope, because you'll have to make sure that the tube lenses are properly matched. If they are not matched, you will not get the magnification that is written on the objective. Now this matching of uh, objective and tube lens is also important for abrasion corrections in many of the microscope designs. So on the subject of abrasions, I will not uh, spend a lot of time on that. What are abrasions? Abrasions are imperfections in lenses. So there can be inherent defects. In this image, for example, you see that the central portion of the image is in focus, but the surrounding portions are not in focus. So this can be a result of some kind of a spatial abrasion like spherical abrasion. 
Now, in this image on the right, you see there are these uh, colored fringes, and this is a result of chromatic abrasion. This means light of different colors don't get focused at the same uh, focal spot. So you see these colored fringes. Now, in early microscopy design, um, the designers thought that you know we can simply increase the diameter of the lens. By increasing the diameter of the lens, we should be able to increase the numerical aperture or light gathering capability of the lens. But they soon discovered that as you increase the diameter of the lens, the aberrations increase. So it's counterproductive to increase the diameter of the lens. So a very effective objective lens design, at least in early microscopy, was to use small diameter lenses with large curvature. The small diameter would decrease aberrations and the large curvature would give a higher numerical aperture. Now, this idea was almost driven to the extreme by Luen Hook. His microscope was essentially a, a small hole on a metal plate, and this hole had a tiny sphere of glass. The small diameter um, sphere made sure that the aberrations are minimized, and the spherical shape gave it a high curvature, which in turn gave a high numerical aperture. Now, using this system, he was able to magnify, uh, uh, it seems, up to 250 uh, times. The sample was mounted on a tiny pin, which he could very precisely translate in the X and Z direction. And probably by knowing the pitch of the screw, he might have even made measurements uh, on his images. So this was a very sophisticated system, but um, in terms of what it could do, but uh, very extremely simple in design. And Lewin Hook managed to uh, image several uh, structures like a section of ash tree, uh, several uh, bio other biological samples, and so on. So some of the first scientific studies using a microscope was done by Lewin Hook. Now, the modern uh, objective design still borrows the idea from Lewin Hook. If you look at the friend lens of a modern objective, of course, objective has several lenses to correct for abrasions, but the friend lens is still a small diameter sphere. In fact, a hemisphere and the small diameter spherical structure make sure that uh, abrasions are minimized and uh, we get a sufficiently high numerical aperture. So this idea is still used. Now, most of the discussion so far has been about the imaging path of the microscope. We also need to discuss the illumination path of the microscope. So what is the illumination path? The illumination path essentially has a light source, usually a lamp, and we need to find a way to concentrate the light from the lamp onto the sample plane. Now, a lamp like this is an inco incoherent light source, and intuitively you might think that, okay, if it is an incoherent light source, I can use one lens to collimate the light and another lens to focus the light. And then I can keep my sample at the focal point of this lens. But there is a problem. The problem is this now acts like a microscope or an imaging system. And what this actually does is it creates an image of the lamp filament on my sample plane. Because what you've essentially built is a imaging system that is imaging this object, which is the lamp filament, onto my sample plane. So an attempt to focus the light to, you know, if, if I'm attempting to concentrate the light on my sample plane by trying to focus the light from the lamp filament to the sample plane is counterintuitive because you end up creating an image of the lamp filament. And that is not what we want. Now, this was a problem in early microscope design and it took some time uh, to solve. And this was solved uh, by Kohler, August Kohler. And he developed what is called as a Kohler illumination. So in Kohler illumination, you have the lamp filament. Uh, you have what is called as a collector lens placed in front of the lamp filament. The collector lens is placed exactly at its focal distance away from the lamp filament. And if you consider a point exactly at the center of the lamp filament, the light from this point will come out collimated because this distance is the focal distance of the collector lens. I can place a second lens, and this lens is called the field lens. So now what happens is light from this point is imaged 
at focal distance away from the field line. So this is the focal length of the field line. Now I'm going to introduce a third lens. And this lens is called the condenser lens. So you, some of you might have heard about the condenser lens. And the condenser lens is kept exactly at focal distance away from this point, which means the separation between the field lens and the condenser lens is exactly focal length of field lens plus focal length of condenser lens. If you have this condition, then light will come out collimated, which means the light from the center of the lamp filament is coming out as a collimated beam pencil. We call it a beam pencil and I can keep my sample somewhere here. Now this arrangement is demonstrating that the light from the filament is not focused but collimated, but it's still not explaining how light is concentrated on the sample plane, right? Let us consider a second point on the filament, this time situated slightly above the central point. And you see the light from this point creates a beam pencil that is slightly shifted or tilted up. And the second beam pencil intersects the first beam pencil at the focal point of the condenser. Let us consider a third point, this time at the bottom of the lamp filament. The light from this point creates a beam pencil that is now tilted down, again intersecting the first two beam pencils at the focal point of the condenser. So what is this configuration providing us? You create all these beam pencils that intersect at the focal plane of the condenser. The different points on the lamp filament create a cone of beam pencils. What you see here is a, so you see this in 2D, but actually this is in 3D, a cone. And the apex of the cone is at the focal point of the condenser. So you have all these beam pencils intersecting at the focal point. This is like putting a large number of flashlights onto a given point, And this creates this intense uniform illumination. But the individual beam pencils are all collimated, so they don't create a image of the lamp filament. So colder illumination condenses the light. And condensing is a way of concentrating the light without focusing. Now, where is the image of the lamp filament formed? Image of the lamp filament formed is uh, it's here. It's a friend focal plane of the condenser. And this plane is important when you are talking about uh, contrast enhancement, about which you will listen in the next lecture by Steve Brown. Now, the concept of Kohler illumination, as I was mentioning, was developed by August Kohler. He was a professor at the University of Vienna in Germany. And this is the original woodcut uh, from Kohler. And if you observe carefully, you can see the beam pencils intersecting at the focal point of the condenser, like we described before. Now, if you put the illumination system and the imaging system together, we get this configuration. Now, this might uh, look a bit intimidating, but this is the illumination path. Illumination path has the lamp filament, the collector lens, the field lens, and the condenser. There are a few other things as well. This is the imaging path. The imaging path has the objective and the tube lens. If you are only interested in capturing the image on a camera or, uh, or, or some kind of uh, screen. And if you are interested in observing the image through the eyepiece, you need the eyepiece as well as your eye. So the illumination path together with the imaging path essentially builds a microscope for you, a transmitted light microscope. Now, one of the first uses of microscope as a tool for serious science um, was done by Robert Hooke. Now, if you're a physicist, you will know Hooke's for the Hooke's law. Uh, and if you're a biologist, you will know him because he uh, discovered the cell. Now, okay. this is a microscope that he used. Now, let's try to identify the components that we learned about on this rather primitive microscope. The light source is an oil lamp. So you would burn the oil lamp here. The collector lens is a, a flask filled with water. So remember the bottle filled with water we saw in uh, the earlier video. So this is my collector lens. 
and there is a condenser lens. The condenser lens condenses the light onto my sample. Oh, sorry, not my sample, Robert Hooke's sample. And if you observe where the objective is placed, it's placed in this na very narrow uh, cylindrical structure. So most likely the objective had a very small diameter and a very large curvature, like uh, we discussed before for uh, because of reasons uh, I mentioned before. Now, this is a finite tube length configuration. The sample is placed between F and 2F, but closer to F, which means the image is formed at a large distance away from the objective. And that's why you need this really long barrel. And that also means you have a very large magnification. So this is the stem, rather carefully designed, um, bit primitive, but you know, a lot of thought has gone into design the system. And Robert Hooke, uh, looked at all sorts of things, snow, needle, racer, uh, and its most significant observation test, you know, where freeze and the core can be looked at a thin section of core apparently to discover or, or name what we now know as cell, biological cell. Some more images from the very famous book uh, that he published called Micrographia. Now, the last concept that I want to discuss is the concept of resolution. The concept of resolution was developed by Ernst Abbey. Ernst Abbey, again, was a professor at uh, University of Vienna. And he was really concerned about developing a theory for imaging. And according to Ernst Abbey, the resolution of a microscope decreases with wavelength. Resolution of a microscope decreases with wavelength and increases with numerical aperture. Now, this cannot be understood using geometric optics. If you want to understand this, we need to look at light as a wave. We need to look at what is called as wave optics. Now, James Max, uh, Maxwell, he described light as a transverse electromagnetic wave. He said, uh, there is an oscillating electric field, which gives rise to an oscillating magnetic field and an oscillating magnetic field gives rise to an oscillating electric field and they sustain each other. You don't need a medium for light to propagate. And the light itself propagates in a plane perpendicular to the electric field and the magnetic field. Right? Now, this can be a bit complicated to comprehend. So we might want to look at a wave that is not uh, electromagnetic, a um, rather simpler transverse wave, for example, waves in water. So here I have a video that describes waves in water. So uh, let's try to see what he's trying to look at. Is what happens to a water wave when it passes through an aperture? Well, I've fitted an aperture here, but it's rather too wide for what I need at the moment. So if I fit these sliding doors, I can make an aperture that's about uh, about three centimeters across. And if you now look at the screen, you can see that as the waves pass through the aperture, they spread out. This spreading out of a wave as it passes through an aperture is known as diffraction, and it's a property of all types of waves. So what do you think controls how much the wave spreads out? Well, one possibility is the width of the aperture. And what do you think would happen if I made the aperture smaller? Well, you might be surprised to learn that a narrower aperture leads to more spreading out of the wave, more diffraction. If instead I make the aperture wider, then after it's settled down, you can see that the wave becomes less spread out. The diffraction is less pronounced. And if I were to make the aperture very wide indeed, then there'd be hardly any diffraction. Well, I'm now going to return the aperture to its original width and take a look at the effect of changing the wavelength of the wave. Now remember, I can change the wavelength by altering the frequency of the paddle using this control here. If I make the wavelength longer, you can see that the waves become more spread out beyond the aperture, more diffraction. And if I make the wavelength smaller again, here's where we started, 
then even shorter wavelengths, then there's less diffraction. So here are the two separate factors that affect the diffraction of a wave passing through an aperture. The wave spreads out more if the aperture is made narrower or if the wavelength of the wave is increased. And conversely, it spreads out less with a wider aperture or a shorter wavelength. In fact, all kinds of waves, not just water waves, exhibit diffraction at an aperture, as long as the aperture is not too big. <laughs> There is an interesting description about diffraction in water waves that probably helped you understand how diffraction is affected by wavelength and the, um, the size of the aperture. To summarize, if the size of the aperture is larger, diffraction is less. And if the size of the aperture is smaller, diffraction is greater or larger. Now, what happens if you have two apertures placed side by side? Both apertures will diffract light and these two diffracted patterns will interfere with each other to create diffracted orders of light. So you, what you end up having is a fringe pattern created by interference of diffracted waves and that causes maxima and minima. This is something we can observe in two this video. Two sources of ripples, which are basically like the two slits. When I create ripples with a single source, they travel out with circular wave fronts. Nothing particularly surprising there. But if I add a second source of ripples, then we start getting an interesting pattern. This pattern is created by the ripples from the two sources interacting with each other. Where they meet up peaks with peaks and troughs with troughs, the amplitude of the wave is increased. That's what we call constructive interference. But if the peak from one wave meets up with the trough from the other, then we get destructive interference and there's basically no wave there. And this is exactly what was happening with the light. So that video demonstrated how the, uh, the light from two slits create diffraction patterns and they interfere with each other to create this maxima and minima, the diffracted orders of light, um, as we call it. Now let's take two situations. Situation one, where the slits are widely spaced. And the slits are widely spaced, the diffracted orders are closely spaced. When the slits are closely spaced, the diffracted orders are widely spaced. Or in other words, the angle between the zeroth order and the first order is larger in this situation compared to this situation. Let's now consider two double slits, each with the same spacing, but let's um, illuminate them with different wavelengths. The first double slit is illuminated with blue light. Blue light has a shorter wavelength, means less diffraction. That means the diffracted orders are closely spaced. The second double slit is illuminated with a uh, red wavelength, which is a longer wavelength compared to blue. So more diffraction, which means the diffracted orders are widely spaced. This is something you can observe. So if you had uh, a microscopy lab, so this is something we used to do during the microscope, Bangalore microscopy course um, in the lab, look at the back focal plane of the objective. When you look at the back focal plane of the objective, you see the zeroth order, and zeroth order has all kinds of wavelength that is, uh, does not depend on wavelength. But now if you look at the first order, the blue light is closer to the zeroth order. That means the angle between the blue light and the zeroth order is smaller, and the angle between the red light and the zeroth order is larger. So shorter um, diffracted angle for the blue light and larger diffracted angle for the red light. Now, how does all this translate into our concept of resolution? Let us assume I have this double slits. 
and I cannot see it with my naked eye and I want to observe it under a microscope. So I'm going to use a fine, infinite tube length microscope, which means my objective is going to be placed at its focal length from my sample. The sample is diffracting light. You see I have this diffracted orders of light coming in and my objective is collecting the zeroth order and several of the higher diffracted order. So objective is collecting the zeroth order and several of the higher diffracted orders. The light comes out collimated and the tube lens will focus the light to create an image. So what is the tube lens really doing here? The tube lens is interfering the zeroth order with the higher orders. And what you see as an image is actually an interference pattern created by the tube lens. So an image is formed by the interference of the diffracted light with the undiffracted light, which means to create an image or in other words, to resolve to um, these two objects distinctly, the objective sh should have the ability to collect at least the first order diffracted light. If you cannot collect at least the first order diffracted light, the system cannot resolve these two points as separate. Let's try to bring these two slits closer together. So when the slits come closer, diffraction increases, the diffracted angle increases, and this particular objective is unable to collect any of the diffracted orders. It is unable to collect even the first order diffracted light. Of course, it collects a zeroth order. The tube lens is collecting some light, but it does not have, it has a zeroth order light, but it does not have any of the higher order diffracted light to interfere the zeroth order light with. So an intensity pattern is produced, but no image is produced, which means this system fails to resolve these two points distinctly because the objective failed to collect any of the higher order diffracted light. Now this is, this might be a little bit of a complicated concept, but it is important if we need to understand the concept of resolution. Now this starts to explain several things. Why does resolution depend on wavelength? Because shorter the wavelength, smaller are the diffracted orders. Smaller is the angle between the zeroth order and the higher diffracted orders. It means for a given numerical aperture, smaller wavelength can resolve more. Similarly, for a given wavelength, if you have a higher numerical aperture, so higher numerical aperture means you can collect light at a larger angle. So an objective with a higher numerical aperture collects light at a larger angle, which means it has the ability to collect diffracted orders that is coming in at a larger angle. So for a given wavelength, a uh, objective with a larger numerical aperture will resolve better. Now, finally, what difference does the immersion media make? So you might know about uh, air objectives and objectives that use immersion media. And you might also know that when you use immersion media, the resolution of the, of the system increases. So what difference does the immersion media make? So usually the sample is mounted between two cover slits, two glass cover slits. The diffracted light from the sample is now traveling from glass, and this is a air immersion objective. So the diffracted light is traveling from glass into air. It's traveling from a denser medium to a rarer medium, which means the light will uh, refract away from the normal. So the diffracted light is undergoing additional refraction because of which it is refracting out and the objective fails to collect some of the higher ordered diffracted light because of this additional refraction at the glass air interface. We can remedy this situation by filling the space with an index matching fluid, which is our immersion fluid. And if the immersion fluid has a refractive index that matches that of the glass, the refractive index difference is minimized this refraction is minimized and the objective is able to collect more higher ordered uh, diffracted light, thereby increasing resolution. So this is the last concept that I wanted to share with you. The concept of resolution was uh, developed by 
Ernst Abbe. Ernst Abbe related resolution to diffraction. He established that resolution is diffraction limited. And now I hope you are able to appreciate that. And his ideas were published in this paper that he published in German in 1873. He used uh, what is called, uh, called as a Bay test slide, which is still in use. So he demonstrated that if the, the slits are closely spaced, the diffracted orders are widely spaced. If the slits are uh, widely spaced, the diffracted orders are closely spaced. So he very accurately related diffraction to resolution and established this relation. Now, I want to end this presentation with this slide. We started this presentation uh, with Sheldon Cooper telling us that uh, our journey in physics started with philosophers and thinkers looking up at the night sky. And this is exactly what the modern physicists are still doing to unravel the mysteries of physics. So the night sky, among other things, is our window into the past. So if you are intrigued about uh, time machines, the largest time machine is out there, the night sky. So look up at the night sky. Thank you so much. Yeah, let me know uh, if you have any questions. Much. So um, uh, what I wanted to do is I'm going to follow up on... Um, uh, Manoj gave a very nice uh, basis of how a microscope works and how uh, an image is formed and maybe the, the principles and optical physics behind that. So I'm going to go to the next step now and talk about contrast enhancement, which becomes really critical to being able to understand um, and, and visualize things in samples that we look at, which often have very little natural contrast. Okay, so what you see here is a phase contrast image and a differential interference contrast image. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, so Manoj went through uh, the optical system of the microscope and uh, just briefly summarizing uh, the things that he had um, spoken about, um, you can see we have light that comes into the microscope. And what I'd like you to see, so he described very well how you have these angles of light that come in, they go through the sample and the light is diffracted. And light being scattered or diffracted, the smallest particles uh, within the sample are diffracted at the steepest angles and the shortest wavelengths of light are bring all of those diffracted information back closer towards the collectible um, aperture of the objective lens, which has a limited numerical aperture. And uh, what I want you to maybe understand a little bit are that the optical system that he went through is made up of a, a set of conjugate planes. And this is important for a lot of the ways that we're gonna take advantage of the microscope to develop contrast. And um, what you notice is that we have light that's going parallel, and this was the color illumination that he had spoken about, evenly illuminating the, the sample with parallel light and diffracted information. So at the sample, the diffracted information is angular. So you have these angles of light, again, steeper angles for the smaller, highest uh, resolution particles. But then when we look at these planes shown in blue at the back aperture, they're actually organized very differently. It's sort of like when we were asking about a real versus um, a virtual image. So all of the information of the image of your sample is in these focal planes shown in blue, but it's organized very differently. It's organized in spatial frequencies. So you can think about that zero order light being light that is undiffracted, that doesn't interact with the sample, and then your first order being a lower spatial frequency, for example, than the second order, which is higher diffracted orders. 
So that's organized here very well with the lowest spatial frequencies in the center and the highest spatial frequencies out in the edge. And we're going to take advantage of that in these contrast techniques to enhance the contrast and see things that would otherwise be very difficult to visualize. Okay. So Manoj also had mentioned uh, Ernst Abbe and and one of the first techniques I'm going to talk about is phase contrast imaging. And this was a technique developed by um, a scientist named Fritz Zernike. And what Zernike, uh, he had won the Nobel Prize for this technique and wrote a very nice review in 1955 in Science Magazine. And in one sentence, he sort of summed up Ernst Abbe's theory. And you can see that on top here. And it says the microscope image is the interference effect of the diffraction phenomenon. And that's sort of a really concise way to describe how a microscope makes uh, an image. So as we know, light is diffracted when it goes through the sample. And I'd like to go a little more detail about what exactly uh, the sample does to uh, objects um, or to light as it passes through it. So, I would like to uh, describe uh, the sample um, as two different types of objects. An amplitude object, which is an object that has a high natural absorption, that, uh, such as a piece of colored glass that will absorb certain wavelengths of light or uh, decrease the amplitude. So here's the waveform. And we know that the wavelength gives us our spectral color. And the amplitude gives us the intensity of light. So an amplitude object is going to decrease the amplitude of light, generally in a wavelength dependent manner, um, or multiple wavelengths. And then we have phase objects that are transparent objects that don't absorb light, but they produce a phase shift. And this is based on the refractive index of the uh, object itself. So what we normally have is in, in most samples that we look at in the microscope is a combination of both. So here's our waveform shown in A, and then you can see in B, we have a piece of glass that, uh, or, or an object that basically just absorbs some of the light. And that's with the refractive index equal of the object equaling the refractive index of the media that the light is transmitting through before it reaches that object. And you can see all it's done is decrease the amplitude of the light, making it less bright. Then we can have an object that's a phase object that would have a refractive index larger than the refractive index of incidence. So if you're coming through air, you're going to hit something that's got a refractive index larger than the refractive index of one. And that compresses this waveform. And when it comes out of that um, uh, sample, the wave reverts back, but it's shifted in phase. So now the wavelength that was right on this dotted line is actually shifted, in this case, about a, uh, a uh, quarter of a wavelength. Okay, or 90 degrees. And as I had mentioned earlier in, Sam, in uh, D here, you can see that what we normally have is something that's got a combination of both absorption and phase shift. Your eyes, however, are really good at seeing changes in intensity, as well as seeing colors within a range. But uh, human eyes are not good at seeing phase shifts or polarization changes. Okay. So how are we going to use these uh, in the microscope? And what are the challenges we're going to look to overcome? Well, first is that many of the things that we want to study, for example, cells, especially live cells, where we can study dynamic um, events, we can't see the, the uh, details because they have extremely little absorption. Um, and these are some cells on a cover slip. And the contrast is maybe 2 to 5% because they have a, a very low absorption and the refractive index of cells is very similar to the background refractive index of the media they're sitting in. So you get a, a very small uh, phase shift within uh, cells as well as low light absorption. 
okay? Um, and within the cells themselves, there are changes uh, of refractive index, and you're going to see that phase contrast can bring those out, but you really have a range between, say, the uh, refractive index of water at about 1.33, and uh, refractive index of about 1.4, which would be really dense areas of, for example, uh, aggregations of proteins. Okay. And uh, another thing I want you to think about is when you're looking at light that's uh, propagating through a cell, the amount of phase shift is dependent on the optical path difference or optical path length. So if you say that this cell here has a higher refractive index than the media, it's a matter of the refractive index as well as the thickness of the cell. So out here in this lamellopodia, you have a small thickness, whereas in the nucleus, you're going to have a much larger thickness and a larger phase shift. Okay? But unstained cells normally have about a quarter of a wavelength of shift or less when compared to the background. So interference that's going to form our image is very minimal, resulting in low contrast. So what we need to do is generate contrast. And I want to define contrast as the ability to distinguish specimen detail when compared to the background or adjacent features. And this is usually measured by the highest and lowest uh, intensity within an image. And just a couple of more definitions. Positive contrast is when the sample is darker than the background. And that's normally what we see. But I'm going to show you one unique example of a technique that's going to actually give you negative contrast, where the sample becomes bright and the background becomes dark. Um, so that'll be uh, another part uh, of, a, of a technique called dark field imaging. Okay. So what do we do before we develop these kind of uh, contrasting techniques? Well, there were still a lot of ways to develop contrast. It was just very difficult to do in live cells or in a very predictable way to look at specific structures. Um, but we stain cells. And one of the pioneers of developing, of, of staining cells was Camillo Golgi. And he came up with a stain that stained uh, neurons. It was called the dark neuron stain or dark reaction. It was a silver impregnation stain. And you can see this neuron here um, standing out uh, against the sort of orange background, which was an artifact of the stain. And um, working with Santiago Ramoni Cajal, who you can see here on the right, in 1906, they earned the Nobel Prize from studying stain cells in the brain and looking at uh, neurons, and they developed what was called the neuron doctrine, which basically said that they determined that the neuron was the fundamental unit of the nervous system. So that was how we would uh, develop contrast and learn things about uh, uh, you know, live tissues or, or fixed tissues at the time. But staining has artifacts. It can change the shape of tissue. And it's also very difficult to do, especially at that time, in live cells. Of course, we're going to talk later in the course about ways to generate contrast and to stain things very specifically uh, in live cells. And uh, I think Nico's going to talk about some of those things tomorrow. So how did Dr. Zernike uh, develop phase contrast? Well, in the 1920s, he was really interested primarily in diffraction. And he studied diffraction patterns, looking at gratings, and, um, and began, to, began to think about phase shift. And then in the 1930s, he uh, began some experiments that led to the first phase contrast microscope. Uh, at the time, there was very little commercial interest when he went visiting uh, uh, microscope companies to try and sell this technique. But uh, pretty quickly, that got turned around and they realized the power and the potential for it. And uh, Zernike ended up uh, selling this technique, which uh, ended up really allowing people to do things in live cells and study dynamics that they couldn't study previously and earned him the Nobel Prize in 1953. Okay, so as I mentioned, in unstained cells, we have a contrast issue. The information is there, but we just can't see it. 
So the big things that we needed to overcome were the sample information, the higher diffracted orders are really, really weak compared to that zero order, the light that's coming straight through that's not interacting with the sample. And we have a very small phase shift that's naturally occurring because of the, the low refractive index uh, relative to the media, as well as the uh, thickness of live cells. So we want to convert that maximum quarter wavelength of phase shift into a larger phase shift. So we want to knock down the background light that's obscuring this information, and we want to enhance the phase shift to maximize constructive and destructive interference, giving us maximum contrast. And that's what a phase contrast microscope does. So um, you can see uh, basically uh, just an example of live cells here uh, in a bright field microscope versus a phase contrast microscope. Uh, it's extremely sensitive and actually can be used because of the contrast that it generates to look at optical path differences on the order of 25 nanometers. So it's, it's quite a sensitive technique, okay? So here again is our diffraction pattern as uh, Manoj had spoke about. And that bright, if you, if you looked at this and graphed it in intensity, that zero order being right here in the middle, and then you have your minus and plus first order, second order diffraction, third order diffraction. What you notice is that the undiffracted light is extremely bright compared to the higher, the first and second order diffraction. And third and fourth order diffractions, of course, are even lower. But it's those higher diffracted orders that all of the structural information of your sample is. So we need to knock this down. And then we need to shift the phase so that we can uh, intensify the interference, both positive, uh, uh, constructive and destructive interference. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, it's relatively simple. Um, as I had shown you those different <clears throat> planes in the microscope, some planes that are organized in spatial frequencies, some planes that have a sample or an image of that sample. Well, if we go into the planes that have everything organized in spatial frequencies, we can basically use a, a filter in this case, it's an annulus, to restrict exactly where our zero order light is. And this is called a phase annulus or a phase uh, plate that goes in the condenser of the microscope and it restricts the zero order to a specific location. So then we also have a, a uh, conjugate plane, an aperture plane in the objective lens, and we have what's called a phase ring. So the zero order light that's coming through that annulus then comes in and hits this phase ring. And I'm gonna go through this in more detail and uh, explain in more uh, detail exactly what's going on. But basically you've restricted the zero order light and then this ring that's in the objective is actually a neutral density filter and it reduces the zero order light by 60 to 90%. And it's also a wave plate that advances the zero order light by about a quarter of a wavelength uh, relative to the background light into the higher diffracted orders so that we're gonna take that quarter wavelength of phase shift and make it closer to a half a wavelength of phase shift. The phase ring that's in the objective is about 25% larger than the, uh, the ring in the condenser that lets the zero order light through. And that's to make sure that you don't have light sneaking around the phase ring, which would uh, obscure the image and uh, degrade the uh, phase contrast image. Okay. So this is a little more detail on exactly what that phase ring is. And this is usually deeply embedded inside the objective lens. And you can see in lower magnification lenses, it tends to be closer to the back of the objective lens. Higher magnification lenses, it's actually deeply embedded in the center of the lens itself, closer up to the front of the lens. And that phase ring 
is in cement in between usually two lens groups. And it consists of a few things. So you have this, uh, this layer of optical cement, M, and then you have a neutral density filter, this thin black area here. And then what's shown as DF here is actually a phase plate that is basically just a type of material that's got a higher refractive index and shifts the phase. Okay, so that's a phase plate neutral density filter that's going to basically hit where that zero order light is. And then your diffracted light is going to go through uh, the other areas because it's coming from the entire aperture that's left open. Um, it's also important to note that this phase ring, however, unfortunately does block some of your diffracted light, especially lower order diffracted light that's closer to the zero order. And that's going to end up giving us some artifacts that we're going to talk about in a little more detail. So hopefully this will clarify it a little more. You have these aperture planes here and here that I spoke about where you have your phase annulus and your objective phase ring. You now have zero order light defined by this annulus that's gonna go in parallel beams through your sample. This sample is now gonna diffract light and your diffracted light is gonna then go and get collected by the objective lens, okay? And the zero order light, the light that's not interacting with the sample hits this phase ring and is attenuated or knocked down in intensity or am amplitude. And unfortunately, as you can see, also some of your diffracted light is. But this is basically how simple a phase contrast system is. And if we were in the lab, we would actually go in and we would show how to adjust and align this phase annulus with the phase ring and the objective. And there's a bunch of tutorials online. Um, we have a website, microscopyu.com, but all of the major microscope manufacturers have really good educational websites. And you can find a lot of this information on the microscope manufacturers' uh, websites. I'll give you uh, at the end uh, the URL for ours, as well as um, one called Molecular Expressions, which a number of uh, the figures you're gonna see throughout the talks uh, come from. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as we spoke about, um, waves interfere, and this is just a quick review that you can have constructive interference. If your, uh, for example, peaks and troughs line up perfectly, then you're going to sum, say, this wave A and B, and you'll get a larger peak if they line up. However, if your trough aligns with a peak, then they'll sum and you'll end up with a smaller waveform. And this large trough with this uh, small peak ends up with a smaller trough. So it's uh, simply summing of the waveforms. And that's what's happening when you're getting constructive interference, increasing the amplitude, or destructive interference, decreasing the amplitude of the waveform. And it can be shown uh, in other forms, and a lot of the websites will show it this way, where you'll have um, this green wave here, which is basically the sum of the blue wave, which is your diffracted information, and the red wave, which is your background, light that's not interacting with your sample. Okay. Okay. So when we have that, what, what I'm, I want to show you here is that if we have a shift of the diffracted wave such that it perfectly overlaps um, here, these two troughs, this would be by definition positive phase contrast or a uh, phase contrast that, that has a positive shift of the wave. And there are many different types of phase contrast systems and they get somewhat complicated. Um, there's positive phase contrast, negative phase contrast, and different types, for example, uh, names they've come up with like dark light light, dark light. Uh, this is apodized dark light. I'll talk about apodization soon. Um, 
basically, the only thing I want to say about all the different types of phase contrast is they really work differently depending on your sample. And depending on, if you think phase contrast is something that you're going to want to use in your lab, it really makes sense to just test the systems with the type of sample you're using and maybe look at a couple of different types of phase contrast to determine which is going to be the best fit for the samples. Um, phase contrast has certain challenges with thicker samples, for example, and we'll talk about that later. Certain types of phase contrast work better with thinner samples or thicker samples or higher refractive index samples or lower refractive index samples, for example. Okay, so all the components, just to sum up again, you have these condenser annuli, you have uh, objectives with phase rings in them, and it's very important, of course, that the annuli is matched for that objective lens so that you can completely overlap the light coming through this annuli with the objective lens phase ring. And another thing that people find uh, useful is a green filter. And this is useful for most transmitted contrasting techniques um, because the, especially if you're looking with your eyes, because the eyes are extremely sensitive to green. So it's gonna enhance that contrast even further. It's also gonna minimize that smear from chromatic aberration, which Manoj had mentioned, and I'm gonna talk about in more detail, which would in something like phase contrast make your edges look fuzzier. So restricting the wavelengths of light, it gives you um, sharper contrast at the edges. And something that's important to have, uh, very useful is called the phase telescope. And this is gonna allow you to look at these aperture planes in the microscope. It's also referred to as a Bertrand lens. Many microscopes have them incorporated into them. Uh, and there's a switch that allows you to switch back and forth between the two. Uh, other microscopes, you'll pull out an eyepiece and put the phase telescope in and allow you to focus. And this is important when you're trying to align the system or to check other types of techniques, whether they're working properly. Um, so just to talk a little bit about aligning the system and showing you if you have the perfect alignment where your phase annuli and you're looking at the back aperture, you will see the phase annuli completely overlapped with the phase ring. And you can see that you have this nice high contrast phase image. But if the alignment is off, depending on which direction it's off, you can see that your contrast drops way off. You have zero order light sneaking through. You're not getting as much contrast. And you also have a shadowing effect that your, your image information just drops off completely on one side or the other. So it's very important for this technique, as well as the next technique I'm going to talk about, differential interference contrast, that the first thing you do is set up your microscope perfectly for color alignment. Then you align the components of your contrasting system. So those are just sort of the, the, the things that you're going to do as typical steps when you are um, trying to uh, adjust and get these techniques working properly in a microscope. So here is uh, just an example of some of the things you can see, for example, in live cells. Uh, this is a, a cell, uh, and this is a movie that was given to me by uh, an old friend of mine, Alexei Kojikov, who's a, a terrific microscopist. And what you can see here is a live cell and in phase contrast, you're able to make out this lamellopodia and these fine philopodia at the leading edge. You can see these lysosomal vesicles, and you can really resolve a lot of cell structure in a cell that's basically transparent. So it can be quite powerful. Um, there are some limitations, and you probably noticed that you have sort of these bright white uh, edges, especially on the larger structures uh, like the leading edge of the cell. And that's called phase halo. And that's one of the artifacts or limitations of phase contrast. Phase contrast also has a really tough time with very thick samples because a very thick sample is gonna give you more than a wavelength of phase shift. And another problem is if you're trying to combine thing, phase contrast 
with other techniques like fluorescence microscopy. Uh, fluorescence microscopy, uh, your, your phase ring is going to absorb some of that precious emitted light from your uh, fluorescent sample. Um, another problem is that the phase uh, annuli itself obscures a lot of the angles of illumination. So it, it significantly limits the resolution. But you're trying to look at contrast and you can learn an awful lot from seeing the contrast, but you are giving up resolution. It's a sort of a typical trade-off. And in microscopy, one of the things you're gonna learn is that there's an awful lot of trade-offs. Uh, there's no, no free way to uh, you know, get everything. You have to give up something in general uh, to get what you're interested in seeing, okay? So the phase halo is because some of the high order sample information, and I mentioned this, it's usually the, the diffracted orders that are very close to the zero order uh, still get blocked by the phase ring. And, and that's going to um, give you sort of these bright artifacts next to your dark structures that are large. And destructive interference doesn't take place and you get a contrast reversal. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's more, more prevalent for large objects. Um, yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. I'm going to try and go through pretty quickly, but you can always ask uh, some questions at the end because what I'm covering today in the course normally would be three separate hour long lectures that kind of condensing into hopefully uh, just over an hour. Let me look at my timer. I'm 29 minutes in now. Okay, so I think we'll do pretty well here. So there's a one way to minimize this halo artifact, um, and it's a system called apodization or apodized phase contrast. And basically what they do in apodized phase contrast, and you can see how it affects it. Here's a, a cluster of, of cells here um, on the, the left of this uh, figure three, and you can see that white halo artifact, and on the right, you can see it with apodized phase contrast. So it's still there, but it's significantly minimized. And how we do that is by instead of having, say, 25% uh, attenuation, which would be an ND4 filter in the, in the uh, phase ring, we actually have a, uh, a phase ring that's got uh, ND4 here surrounded by ND2, which is attenu attenuating half the light rather than 25%. Or, uh, trans sorry, transmitting, I, I flipped it. But it's uh, transmitting 50% of the light rather than 25% of the light. So that you get a smoother gradient at those edges and you're not blocking as much of the diffracted light, but still attenuating the zero order significantly. Okay. So as I mentioned, there are limitations. If you look at the aperture plane, and this is also where all of that high spatial frequency information that, that forms your fine cell structure detail in your microscope images, you can see that you're blocking a lot of that aperture plane in phase contrast. Whereas in DIC, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, you have a, 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 a full aperture of the microscope, okay? So you do get poor lateral resolution due to the limited aperture. And as I mentioned, very thick samples can shift light more than a wavelength. Okay. Um, however, as I mentioned uh, early on, a uh, phase shift is extremely powerful to look at very, very small differences in, in path length. So if you have very high NA phase contrast, you can see things like optical sectioning where um, one of the samples that we would normally look at in the, in the labs in the course would be um, cheek cells. So here's a cheek cell. And what I want you to see here are these ridges, which only at very high NA are you able to discern in the microscope. Um, and you can see these surface ridges on the epithelial cell. Then you can see a plane in the center where the nucleus is in focus and you can see some of the cellular structures. And then you can see the bottom um, surface of the cell as well. So phase contrast with high numerical aperture can actually do a very nice job of, 
of optical sectioning. Uh, another thing is because it's very contrasty, it, it, it's, it's a nice way to see certain structures as well as give you a context for fluorescence imaging, which you can generally do in a time lapse when you are uh, basically taking sequential channels. And here's sequential time lapse of uh, phase contrast, and you can see these actin stress fibers here, um, as well as the mitochondria moving around here in the cell. Uh, actin stress fibers, I believe, were actually first noticed and discovered uh, using phase contrast microscopy, the lamella, the filopodia. And then on the right, you see uh, GFP tubulin labeled, so you can get uh, the tubulin signal there and then uh, a background uh, context for it with your phase contrast. Okay. All right, so quick review, light coming through, zero order, lights diffracted, hits your phase ring, knocks down the zero order, and allows you, uh, as well as phase shifts the zero order relative to the diffracted information, enhancing your interference and attenuating the background. And pretty simple system. So uh, I think that's pretty much it for phase contrast. But what would happen if we were to increase contrast by blocking all of the zero order light? So if light that's going through the sample, in, getting collected by the lens now, if these beams came in at such a steep angle that they were not in the collectible range of the lens, say this beam came here and went up, and this beam came here and went up, we would get another technique. And we can, you can actually do this. If you have a microscope that has access, uh, for example, a microscope with DIC, you could take, you can look at those, um, uh, diffracted orders in the back aperture, and you could block the zero order, and you would get a contrast reversal. This would be what they call dark field illumination. So it's very similar to phase, and you can actually get this to work on a microscope if you have a mismatched phase ring, a phase ring that's got a higher numerical, a phase annuli with a higher numerical aperture than the objective lens itself. Um, these are just different methods to uh, implement it on a microscope. But what you see is the cone illuminating the, mic the sample is actually not collected at all by the objective lens uh, because the cone is at a higher numerical aperture and only the diffracted information is collected by the objective lens. So this gives a complete contrast reversal, turns your white background or light background to black, and then you see uh, the structures that would normally be dark as, as white in contrast. And this was actually um, uh, used uh, very successfully to look at extremely small objects. It's incredibly sensitive. You could actually see sub-resolution beads, things that are down in tens of nanometers in size using dark field illumination they're gonna still come through to your detector or your eye at the diffraction limit, but you can detect them uh, e extremely small. So what you're looking at here is a figure from a 1988 paper um, by Hatani and Oreo, where they looked at um, the dynamic instability of microtubules and uh, the growth and catastrophe of microtubules uh, in dark field illumination. And you can see this diatom here. So in transmitted light, you'd have this sort of glass cage in black. And then if you looked at that in dark field, you can see that the sample then looks white against a black background. So it's really good for imaging unstained microorganisms or unstained cells uh, that you want to look at specific structures. It's also good to look at things like single molecules um, but it's very, very sensitive to uh, dirt and dust in the uh, optical system. So it really uh, sort of lost favor. Not that many people use it anymore, but you can see here's a sperm motility assay, just how powerful this is from a contrast standpoint. Of course, your contrast, though, is very binary. It's black and white. There's no, uh, you know, gradient or gray shades there. But if what you're looking at is, is trying to detect a signal, 
it, it's quite powerful. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears and move on to a technique called DIC or differential interference contrast. And this is just showing you a difference of what that looks like compared to phase contrast. And DIC gives you this, what looks like a three dimensional image of your sample. And these are red blood cells or erythrocytes, which are sort of a, a perfect example to show off how DIC works. Um, and you can see that they look very much three-dimensional here, but it's actually a, a pseudo three-dimensionality that is developed based on the thickness of each part of the sample. So you're not really seeing a three-dimensional image. What you're doing is recreating that using a very clever technique that's actually a dual beam interferometer and polarized light uh, in a certain way. And I'm gonna go into some detail on how that really works. It also relies on phase shifts, but uses the differences of the optical path length um, in polarized light uh, to develop this 3D contours of your sample. Okay. So here's our uh, red blood cell or erythrocyte. And the one thing I want you to notice here is that it almost looks like someone is shining a spotlight across it from one side. So you have this bright edge, dark shadow, bright shadow, and then dark shadow here. That's completely artificial and it's based on the orientation of the components of the system what's called the shear axis, which can actually be reversed in a DIC system and allow you to see shadow from, from one direction or the other. But if I wanted to see the same uh, direction, you notice you're not resolving it as well, the contrast in this direction. And that's why it's important to think about the structure you wanna see and have your sample rotated appropriately in a DIC system to generate the contrast to see the structures you're interested in. So if we, if we just talked about the uh, optical path difference, <clears throat> if you can imagine the erythrocyte laying on, a, on the cover slit, we sort of have the outer edge of the cell. It gets much thicker. It's got a higher refra refractive index than the background. So you have this large optical path difference there. Then as it gets thinner towards the center, that optical path difference gets thinner. Then you hit the thick farther edge of the cell and the optical path difference gets large again and then drops off as you get back to the outer edge and go back into just the cover slip, okay? So what does that do in, in, in uh, intensity or the amplitude of our signal? Well, when you see this first edge, you get this sharp amplitude increase then it drops off gradually. You have that shadow here. Then it comes to a, a, a sort of the flat area. Then you get a second increase in amplitude and then a drop off here, which is that dark shadow at the far edge of the cell. So if you looked at just the amplitude of light or the intensity of light, that would be the form you would get. So as I mentioned, the contrast is directional. It's terrific to highlight edges of objects and one edge is brighter than the other. And it really, uh, the orientation of your sample uh, is very important if you wanna see certain structures because structures that are, that are perpendicular to the shear axis will not be visible. So I'm gonna give a really brief review of polarized light. I think uh, G2 is gonna talk about this in more detail, uh, maybe when he talks about how he utilizes polarized light in anisotropy. Um, but um, polarized light for the, uh, I'm gonna discuss briefly uh, and mostly in the context of how we utilize it for differential interference contrast. So what polarized light is, is we have a, a, a basically a, a filter, a polarizer that restricts the angles of light coming through to a single plane here called plane polarized light. And then if you have a second polarizer that's 
that's 90 degrees rotated or perpendicular to the first polarizer, it would block this light completely and attenuate it or um, extinguish that light, right? So that would be called uh, extinction. So you have light that's going in every direction. It's it's then restricted to a single plane and then hits a second polarizer, which uh, extinguishes that light. Um, and how much of that light is extinguished is called the extinction factor. And we know of polarizers from um, sunglasses, for example, that are used to uh, eliminate light that's coming off of certain reflected surfaces, which always ends up uh, generally off a reflective surface uh, perpendicular to the polarization of the sunglasses. Um, okay, and how does polarized light uh, has a very special ways that it interacts with with materials. So certain materials are what we call birefringent, and that means that they have two different refractive indices depending upon how um, the polarized light enters that material so or the direction of that material so one axis of the material will have one refractive index whereas another axis of the material will have a different refractive index and that would be a birefringent material and we're going to take advantage of that uh, in a polarized light system but in polarized light microscopy without differential interference contrast, people actually utilize this to measure the birefringence of materials. And this is really important in things like material science or um, uh, geology, for example, to identify materials. So you have light that's incident, polarized light, it hits a birefringent crystal, and then that beam is split into two orthogonal beams um, one called the ordinary ray that seen, sees the normal refractive index of the material, and then the extraordinary ray, which she sees uh, the second refractive index of that material, depending on the orientation of the uh, polarized light as it enters. Okay, so polarized light, uh, as I mentioned, we have linear polarized light, which is what normally we try to have uh, in a system to enter uh, cleanly when we're starting to use polarized light. But in reality, because the polarized light interacts with surfaces, interacts with the sample, what we generally end up having is some level of phase shift. So in polarized light, we have the two orthogonal components of this light wave, but they are perfectly in phase with one another. And what you end up with here is this light beam uh, that, that's called linearly polarized light. If you shifted those 90 degrees and the peaks of the two orthogonal rays were uh, 90 degrees separated, and then you traced around those peaks, we have what's called circularly polarized light. In reality, what you normally have is something in between, which is elliptically polarized light, which is almost always what you end up with in a polarizing light microscope or a differential interference contrast microscope. And what it can do is allow you to measure the ellipticity or the effect of the material on the polarized light. If you look at a birefringent material like a calcite crystal, you'll actually see two images. And this is just a, a figure of what it would look like looking at a uh, pencil through a calcite crystal and one of the refractive indexes uh, light comes straight through, the other it bends it, so you see two images of that pencil. Okay. So uh, here's a polarizing light microscope. It's basically got uh, high extinction polarizers top and bottom, and we can actually measure the properties of a birefringent specimen in that microscope. And uh, it's very important, again, for things like geology, material sciences, um, and people also utilize live samples uh, to measure the rotation of polarization in a technique called anisotropy. Okay. Um, it's uh, pretty powerful if you do have a sample that's birefringent. 
And this is just showing uh, the spindle apparatus, which is highly birefringent in a polarizing light microscope. Okay. And if you rotate a crystal, which has a, an axis, uh, an optic, an axis of birefringence uh, in a polarized light microscope, you'll see that it turns light and dark as it's either aligned or perpendicular to the shear axis of the, uh, of the polarizers. Okay. So how does a, a differential interference contrast microscope work? Well, basically we're setting up a polarized light microscope. So we have a polarizer, light comes in, it's linearly polarized here. Then it hits, your, it, it hits a prism, which is a birefringent material called in this case, a Wollaston prism or a Nemarski prism. And that light is split into two beams. This is a cartoon which is very much different than the real situation. They want to show you that the two beams are separated, which are the orthogonal beams of your extraordinary and ordinary ray when it's in this material after it's uh, bio, in the birefringent material. But the two beams that actually come out and pass through your sample here are extremely close together. They're so close together that they really ideally need to be less than the resolving power of the microscope. So this distance between the two beams is called the shear distance. And the shear distance should be less than the resolving power of the microscope. And you think about it, if your shear distance or separation is larger than the resolving power of the microscope, what's going to happen? you're going to end up with a double image in the microscope, which is never a good thing. So you have these two beams, they transmit through the sample, and then they come back together. They're recombined with a second birefringent crystal or prism, and then they go through an analyzer, which is basically just another name for a second polarizer, but because it actually analyzes the sample's effect on the phase of the two beams going through it, it, it gives, it uh, is called an analyzer, but it's basically the same as your polarizer and it's perpendicular to your polarizer. Okay. I know this is kind of complicated information and a lot of these tutorials definitely good to go through online and read the detail. Um, it's again, something that's normally covered in, a fairly long amount of time and you can really go into the detail more. Um, so that uh, second prism, as I mentioned, reverses the action of the first, recombines the beams, and then goes through the analyzer. So if you are at extinction with your polarizer and analyzer, in DIC, you'll end up seeing from the phase shift, these light and dark regions, and these are droplets on a, a cover slip. So what we need to do in a DIC system is introduce what's called bias. And anyone that's worked on a DIC microscope knows that when you have the, the maximum extinction, you get a very sort of black and white image here. And then what you wanna do is move slightly off extinction. Depending on the type of uh, microscope, there's a couple of different ways to do that. I think I have a figure to show you that. But when you move off extinction slightly, then you get this very nice shading uh, that looks like a 3D image. If you were to move to one side, incre increase the bias, which is basically just um, advancing one of the uh, orthogonal rays versus the other, you're gonna get shadowing. If you advance one beam versus uh, the other, you'll get shadowing. If you reverse that and retard one beam versus the other, you'll actually reverse the shadow and the, it'll look like the light's coming from the other side of your sample. Okay, so here's a couple of different ways people do that. Um, some people may have a microscope where your prisms have a little screw, no, a little knob on them with a screw and you can translate one prism relative to the other and that'll allow you to uh, to enhance uh, the, the um, ordinary versus the extraordinary wave 
you know, um, or you can use a, a rotating uh, retardation plate, a wave plate, and that'll also allow you to adjust the uh, bias or advance one of the orthogonal beams versus the other. So you could then adjust the ellipticity of the light coming out, allowing you to adjust the contrast. And um, that's basically how you can tune a DIC system to get the contrast that you're looking for. So this is a point I was talking about before. Here's the diatom and you can see that you have these hatch patterns on the diatom. They actually go in both directions. But if you were aligned with the shear axis, you could see that it makes the hatches across here almost invisible. So the rotation of your sample or the orientation of your sample is really important in, in a DIC system. Um, so birefringent samples have, uh, are very challenging in DIC. Um, you can't use, for example, plastic dishes. Plastic is highly birefringent. And that's because when you put a birefringent material through cross polarizers, you get um, the, this color smearing from the, uh, uh, the, the uh, phase shift. So um, plastics and birefringent materials, unless you're looking to use those colors to study the birefringence of the material, uh, you don't really want to use in a DIC microscope. So phase is better for birefringent uh, live samples typically, um, but phase again and does have lower resolution. So um, just a quick comparison, um, sensitive to sample orientation, DIC is, phase contrast is not. Thick samples are, are very good in DIC, um, and uh, phase contrast thick samples, as we know, can have larger than a wavelength of phase shift, so they actually could be very poor with a phase contrast microscope. Birefringent samples, um, not good in DIC, but extremely good uh, for phase contrast. Um, a lot of times people use phase contrast just to screen cells and look at their health, because you can use plastic dishes, which are much less expensive as well. Okay. So DIC, as I mentioned, gives much superior lateral resolution. And that's just because you're using the full aperture of the lenses versus phase contrast, where you're really limiting the uh, illumination angles or the aperture of the, um, of the uh, optical system. Okay. Um, DIC and fluorescence can be combined in sequence. I showed you that before. Uh, here's just another example of that where you're looking at, um, uh, I think it's GFP histones, and then you're uh, looking at the uh, uh, separation of, of, uh, during, during, uh, of the chromosomes during uh, um, cell division, and you can see very nicely the context of that in the DIC image of the cell. Um, yeah, just some more examples of that. And uh, here is uh, just a, uh, a couple of uh, examples um, of, of websites that are really good references. Uh, the microscopyu.com, uh, as well as molecular expressions, which is micro.magnet.fsu.edu. Uh, it's a Florida State uh, uh, website. And again, uh, all of the major manufacturers, uh, Zeiss, like Olympus, have very good educational resources online and available. Okay. I was wondering how the um, how the polarizer actually works. Can you please explain? Well, there's a couple of types of polarizers. Um, a polarizer that uh, we use in microscopes primarily and it's mostly because of cost, are thin film polarizers. And what they are is basically a plastic polymer that's stretched. So all the molecules are pulled in one orientation. So they basically restrict light as a, uh, a rotational filter. 
Um, the other type of polarizer, which has higher extinction, is actually made from crystals and birefringent crystals and uh, things like Glenn Thompson polarizers. So they're much higher extinction, but they're also much, much more expensive. Um, some older polarizing light microscopes and some very, very specialized microscopes uh, use crystal polarizers, but most of them and the polarizers like you get in a pair of polarized uh, sunglasses are just thin film polarizers where it's a polymer that they stretch so that all the molecules all the polymer uh, molecules are pulled in an orientation that restrict the uh, angles of light to uh, a single rotation, a single angle. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, very good. All right, so um, I, let me just hit, uh, so now I'm gonna switch gears completely and I'm going to talk a little bit about the practical aspects of objective lenses. And objective lenses, you know, uh, Manoj did an excellent job of showing how lenses work to create um, an image and how light goes through uh, a lens to uh, form a, a real or uh, an inverted image. Um, but uh, in reality, objective lenses are quite complicated optical systems within themselves. And I'm going to go through a little bit of the trade-offs that we have to make and describe aberrations of lenses and talk more about real lenses that we use on the microscope. Okay, So I'm going to talk about aberrations. I'm going to give you a brief summary of general categories or types of lenses. And then I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, insight into how we actually make objective lenses um, in our factories. Okay, so just simply, what does a microscope objective lens do? Well, the first thing it does is it magnifies things. Uh, but magnification uh, doesn't really uh, provide that much uh, benefit unless we're actually able to resolve details. So an objective lens wants magnifies things as well as using higher numerical apertures allows you to resolve details and minimizes ideally aberrations. Okay, so what type of aberrations do we look at? Well, there's a number in there based on a couple of challenges in real lenses. Um, but one thing I want to describe is um, a simple way that people use to measure the aberrations or the performance of an optical system. And it's called the point spread function. So imagine that we had an object that was below the resolving power of the microscope, something that in optics we would call a diffraction limited object or a diffraction limited spot. In this case, let's say it's a fluorescing bead or a pinhole in a foil that is less than 100 nanometers. And we had a really great objective lens. That spot, if you were in focus, is gonna have that bright zero order in the middle and all these, zero, and these diffracted uh, airy rings outside it. And this is your XY best focus with a very good objective lens that's going to come through at the resolution of the microscope, even though this object is smaller than the resolution of the microscope. So that's perfect focus at X and Y. Now, if we were to focus up and down through this point source or diffraction limited object, we would focus in and out and basically have an hourglass shape as we went from blurry to tight focus and back out to a blurry image on the other side of our object. And if we took that hourglass and we cut it down the middle and we made an XZ representation of what we would call a Z stack of this image, we would get this hourglass. And it would have a very long stretch there. It would be about 800 nanometers based on diffraction. 
uh, in Z and 200 nanometers laterally. And that's for a, your sort of highest resolution 1.4 to 1.5 NA lenses, 1.49 NA lenses with oil immersion. Um, this is the best situation. Uh, and this is what they call the convolution of the optical system. For those of you that use software called deconvolution software, that software is basically uh, designed to take this and put it back into the spot where it assumes that that light came from. So when I talk about aberrations, I'm going to show you lateral point spread functions of the uh, aberrations when I describe how these aberrations um, look in the microscope. And what I'd like to do is talk about aberrations in a way um, that sort of describes them and describes what aberrations we can do something about and what aberrations really are induced by the way you use a microscope and how to minimize them. Because as I mentioned earlier, there are always trade-offs and there's no such thing as a perfect lens. Um, so this is an aberration free point spread function in XZ and XY. Okay, so we have many different types of aberrations we're gonna talk about, um, but we can look at them in two main categories. And they're caused by basically two artifacts of the glass that we use, right? So when you look at those nice figures like Minot showed earlier, we showed that light comes through and parallel light enters a lens and it focuses to a focal point, one focus length away from that lens. And you see a lot of these figures in textbooks and you can look at a simple optical physics book and like many things that they taught us you know, a foundation of, it's an exaggeration to allow you to understand the concept. And it'll always say in the text that this is either an ideal thin lens or a perfect lens. And the reality is there's no such thing as a perfect lens because what happens is in a real lens, you have glass that has volume and curved surfaces. So light that goes straight through the center and hits a flat part of the lens propagates straight through that light. But based on Snell's law that Minoj had covered, when you have light that hits, for example, here, and you have a surface that's at a different angle, going from a low refractive index to a high refractive index, that lens, that light is bent or refracted, propagates through the glass, then it's bent or refracted again. This gets even worse as you get to the more steep edges of the curvature of that volume. And as we talked, as Manoj spoke about, all lenses are based on a sphere to begin with, and they have these curved surfaces and volumes. So what happens is light from the periphery focuses closer to the lens, and light from the axis focuses further away. And you get this smear of focal points rather than a nice, neat little, a focal point, and it's called the sphere of least confusion, and it basically gives you this sort of streak. Um, and uh, that is, is also combined with another property of glass, and that property is called dispersion. So when light enters uh, a glass material and white light, each wavelength of light sees a different refractive index. And Minoj described this when he told you that the, the uh, short wavelengths like violet or blue light are refracted or bent more than the red wavelengths or longer light. This gets very complicated in lens making because it's not like this nice neat figure or, or cartoon that we see uh, in this movie here, where you have this very even spread of all the wavelengths of light, different types of glass material actually have like a fingerprint of dispersion, where some glasses are going to have very low dispersion, some have high dispersion, and glass will have 
longer, dis more dispersion uh, that, that comes out where red wavelength is affected more so than other wavelengths. So it's not linear. It's based on the material and it's quite unique to that material uh, with respect to the uh, wavelength dependence. Okay. Um, so if we, if we look at it as linear, what we can say is that light comes through it has that effect we spoke about before of uh, the volume and the curved surfaces, but it's also affected by dispersion where short wavelengths of light focus closer to the lens, long wavelengths of light focus further away. And that's how chromatic aberration is occurring in, in, in uh, the microscope. And I know it was mentioned earlier, but that's what's actually the cause of it. So when we combine these two things, the curved surfaces and volume and the dispersion of glass, we end up with optical aberrations. And I'm going to cover two basic categories, on-axis aberrations and off-axis aberrations. On-axis aberrations, I would argue, are the most severe in a microscope and also <clears throat> ones that cannot be corrected in the manufacture of the microscope perfectly because they're both possible and in fact very likely in some circumstances to be induced by the way that we use microscopes. Um, okay, and um, these off-axis aberrations are, are sort of uh, a, a, another feature of this, and those are coma, astigmatism, and field curvatures. Okay. Uh, I'll also mention geometric distortions, but these are really things that are um, more common in stereo microscopes, microscopes that have two parallel optical paths, and are not really significant problems generally in the compound microscopes that we'll use for biological science. Okay. So chromatic aberration, I've already defined, so I'll go real quickly. Uh, the blue wavelength shift further, uh, are refracted further than the red wavelengths. And what does this look like? Well, longitudinally, it looks like that color fringe around, um, around a uh, point source of light. Laterally, it looks like you have red, the red light closer to the center and the blue light further out towards the edge. Um, and if we look at, again, the aberration, we can correct for chromatic aberration. And we do that with a, what we call an achromatic doublet. And this achromatic doublet has a biconvex lens and a plano concave lens, and they're cemented together. And these are two different types of glass one with a high dispersion, one with a low dispersion, and they can correct for a couple of different wavelengths of light to bring them into focus together. The challenge is that in very highly corrected lenses, we need to add more glass and more doublets to correct for broader ranges of wavelengths. And that becomes problematic because you can very easily think uh, and look at a physics book on how to calculate an achromatic doublet based on two wavelengths of light and the two types of glass. But if you go and correct for another band of wavelengths and add more glass, it changes all the calculations of your first achromatic doublet. So when you start looking at real objective lenses that may have multiple optical groups of lenses with up to 17 or 18 lenses in them, the calculations for how to design and manufacture those lenses is, is quite complicated. But what I wanna talk about is not how lenses are corrected, but how you can go ahead and take a really well-corrected lens and without understanding things like how chromatic aberration is induced, induce chromatic aberration in your sample. So what I have here is a figure, and this figure now is oh, probably about 20 years old. And it was also from my friend Alexei Kojikov, who provided those earlier movies in the last uh, part of my talk. And what you see here is 
lateral chromatic aberration, not really existing. It's all within one pixel on a camera, but axially with, these are different types of immersion oil, not lenses, but oil. So this is a Nikon lens, a 1.4 MA 60X lens, and it's using immersion oil from Nikon Applied Precision, which became GE Healthcare. Uh, they made a system called the Delta Vision that uses uh, different oils, and Cargill, which is a company that makes immersion media. In fact, they probably make all three of these oils. And you can see that this oil has an 800 nanometer shift of the red signal, but the blue and green signal are co-localized. And that this one actually, you have a, a red signal that's 200 nanometers uh, in the positive direction, but a blue signal that's 400 nanometers in the negative direction. The difference between these three oils is their dispersion number. And it's called the Abbe number for dispersion. And the problem is that it's not listed generally on the oil itself. So if you're using a lens, you should use either the lens that is designated by the manufacturer, uh, the oil that's designated by the manufacturer of the lens, and there are reasons that you would want to use your, you know, other oils that you'd purchase from a company like Cargill. For example, if you wanted an oil that uh, matched the refractive index of water or had uh, the right refractive index at physiological temperature of 37 degrees. But what you need to do is ask your manufacturer, the sales rep, to get the dispersion number that you need for their lenses and it's available and your rep if he doesn't have that information handy should be able to request it and get you the right dispersion number which will then allow you to call Cargill and said yes I need an oil that is got a 1.515 refractive index at 37 degrees and I want that also to um, uh, match the dispersion for my, you know, Zeiss microscope or Olympus microscope at this dispersion number. Okay. So spherical aberration is another one that is induced by the way that uh, we use a, uh, a microscope. And spherical aberration is, uh, I would say, the most serious of monochromatic defects. And it's the uneven focus of the peripheral versus the central rays. And Although the term spherical sometimes confuses people, makes people think of curvature, this is not field curvature. Uh, images don't appear curved in spherical aberration. They appear soft or hazy or slightly out of focus. So if you've ever had um, a microscope that you're trying to focus on something and it just never comes into sharp focus and you're clearly focusing above and below, and it never becomes sharp, that is spherical aberration. And it can be induced by the incorrect cover slip thickness or a refractive index mismatch of immersion media with the sample, but it's also induced by your sample itself. Okay, so what does spherical aberration look like in, in the microscope? Well, as I said, it looks soft or hazy. Everything here is in focus, but it's very soft. And here is two uh, images of a three color fluorescent cell. And the one on the left has severe spherical aberration and the one on the right is corrected. So what do you see? You see with spherical aberration corrected, you have extremely high contrast compared to the image with spherical aberration. You can still make out some structure in the nucleus and the DAPI signal here. You can make out the mitochondria mitochondria and red, you can make out these actin stress fibers, but it just looks soft or hazy. I did this on a microscope by taking an oil immersion lens and using water. And the left image is using water on an oil lens, and the right image is using uh, oil. And that's a good way, uh, I figured, to show what spherical aberration looks like. It's also very apparent in transmitted light microscopy. So you can see on the right, this image just has much sharper contrast 
And that's because spherical aberration has is, is been corrected versus the hazy image on the left. And you know, depending on the size of the structures you're looking at, this may or may not make a difference. But if you are looking at things that are at the limit of resolution, this can make the difference between being successful in studying the phenomenon you're interested in or not. Okay, so what's the point spread function look like in Z with spherical aberration? Well, here's that ideal point spread function. Here's a point spread function with spherical aberration. So your main point of uh, focus is here and there's no uh, symmetry in it. You have no signal above the point of main focus, but a lot of light that's going down into the tail below focus. So this type of uh, aberration occurs just a few microns into a live sample because of the changing refractive index of your sample. And imagine if you had, um, I think I have another figure that'll explain this a little better. Yep, here we go. So here's your perfect little point spread function at the cover slit, which by the way is when an optical designer is trying to solve the math to design a lens with those 17 or 18 optical elements in it and design it and manufacture it, they assume that you're only going to look at a point source of light that is at the surface of a cover slit. The cover slips are always exactly 170 microns thick and that you'll only use one wavelength of light. And it allows them then to take these very complex equations and design complicated objective lenses. But reality is people need to focus deeper. So this is the point spread function at the surface under design criteria. Just two microns into the sample, you start to see this point of focus shifting and you see this small rocket ship. 10 microns in, you have a really, really faint signal where your main focus is and all of the light primarily down in these rays below. And how does this affect you and your imaging? Well, you're going to learn probably, I think later in the course, about a confocal microscope. Well, a confocal microscope basically illuminates a point and then has a parfocal or confocal pinhole, which would be at that same spot. So if you're illuminating here and your pinhole is here and all of your light is down here, it's not going to get through your pinhole. That's why anyone that's used a confocal knows that as you focus deeper, your signal drops off very quickly. If you are doing something like building an optical trap, and this is something that many, many years ago when I was helping people doing technical support uh, in my early years at, at Nikon 20 years ago, um, I would get a call and somebody would say, you know, I built an optical trap and I think it's working really, really well because it's pulling particles into the trap, but then it shoots them out the bottom of the trap. That's spherical aberration. So if you have, if you're designing your own optical systems using confocal optical trapping, this can be a very, very serious problem. It can also make things very hazy and obscure the information that you're really interested in. Okay, so we can correct for it, as I had mentioned, but only under certain circumstances, assuming that we only work at the cover slit. So I'm going to try and speed up because I only have about 10 minutes left here. Um, so how do we correct for it? Well, if, you, if any of you have objective lenses that have a collar on them called a correction collar, and it'll normally have uh, marks on it that'll tell you uh, how thick a cover glass it'll work with. That's actually not correcting for cover glass thickness. I mean, it is, but what it's really correcting for is spherical aberration induced by the longer optical path by a thicker than usual cover slip or a shorter optical path by a thinner than usual cover slip. And as we know that spherical aberration is a difference between the axial rays going through the lens or the rays that are going through the curved periphery, well, what if we could change the angles of those peripheral rays without changing the angles of the axial rays? That's exactly what we're doing when we have
a correction collar in an objective lens. We adjust the angle of the, the incident angle of the peripheral rays without affecting as much the angles uh, in the center of the lens. Okay, so how does it work? So here we have an objective lens and it's got uh, this, cover this correction collar here. And you can see it's got different cover glass thicknesses, but it also tells you that this is at 37 degrees because temperature, uh, immersion oil is, is uh, just like other oils, gets thinner when it gets warmed up. It also decreases in its refractive index or optical viscosity. So heating up your sample induces spherical aberration if you don't correct for it. <clears throat> so if we have this lens and we cut this lens away, you can see all of those lenses inside it. And here is that correction collar. <clears throat> and here's a pin that's attached to that correction collar in a spiral groove that's cut into the brass around the lens. We put all of these lens groups <coughs> in one, um, in, in one uh, brass tube, and then these lens groups sit in a fixed brass tube, and then we see there's a difference in, whoops, in the angle from here to here. So what happens is these move back and forth, these stay stationary, this space here gets larger and smaller, and this peripheral angle then changes as we move these back and forth. But the X, the rays going through the center, their angles don't change very much. So that's exactly what a correction collar is doing. So how do you minimize spherical aberration? Well, you can work uh, with immersion media that matches your sample's refractive index. Um, you can use cover glass that's measured to be exactly uh, 170 microns or 0.17 millimeters, or you can improve things by buying uh, very high precision cover slips. You can image as close to the cover slip as possible, try and work as close to 23 degrees, or get oil that is designed to work at higher temperatures, or use a correction collar or an objective lens with a correction collar. These correction collars do have a limited range. So sometimes you just have to take the best trade-off. Okay. So real briefly, coma is very similar to spherical aberration, but is from light off axis. And there's really not much you can do to correct for it. Um, it's more severe as most aberrations are at the outer parts of the uh, objective lens field. Um, and basically it's because light, light, it's when light from the axis of the lens center per, focuses in one zone and light from further from the axis focuses in another. You end up with this smear of focal points towards the uh, periphery and it's more pronounced as all aberrations are at higher numerical aperture. And it can be accentuated by prop, improper alignment of the microscope so if you're seeing this, you can try to align the microscope and improve upon it. <clears throat> but as you can see, it's more, uh, this is a, a, a cartoon of coma, and you can see it's much worse at the periphery. Most detectors generally uh, look more at the center, and you should always try and use the center of the lens for any quantitative analysis, if at all possible. Astigmatism is uh, similar to coma, but it's where points appear more stretched at the, uh, at the periphery, and it actually changes its orientation um, from uh, being closer to the uh, focus of your sample from both sides of the sample. And it'll appear as a line in one direction that as you go through focus shifts to the other direction. Less sensitive to NA, generally caused by asymmetry in lens manufacturing. And um, this is something that is also an issue a lot of times with mirrors and flat surfaces in an optical system. So very often an issue when you're using, for example, lasers and mirrors in techniques like total internal reflection fluorescence for single molecule imaging. Um, so here's astigmatism. Um, 
you have a sagittal or tangential, depending on whether you're on the near side of focus versus the far side of focus. And then there's field curvature, which is due again to the outer, the curved surfaces of lenses. And when it's very severe, not all parts can be in focus at once. It's never completely eliminated. What we generally try to do is just make the lenses wide enough that we don't use the outer edges and your eyepiece and camera ports are smaller generally than the complete field of view of the objective lens. And nowadays that's getting trickier with these larger chip cameras, but we do mask to block the, the very outer edge where, where curvature is more severe. Um, and you can see here, for example, you can have focus in the center or focus in the periphery, but you can't get it all in focus at the same time. Uh, last one is geometric, that's barrel or pin cushion. And this is really due to, uh, again, parallel optical paths um, and usually in stereo microscopes. And you can see it looks like it bows out like a barrel or sticks uh, in like a, a pin cushion. And just something that you can recognize, it's worse when you have uh, samples that have regular structures like grid patterns. Um, I think I'll skip this in the order of time, but it's basically all the information on the objective lens, um, different types of lenses. Uh, basically, as you get more corrections, you put more glass in lenses. Why is this important? Well, you also decrease transmission generally, the more glass you put in lenses. Also, lenses get much, much more expensive the more corrections you make. Uh, these were very traditional types of, uh, of corrections. Nowadays, lenses are really kind of custom made based on their applications. Um, anyone that uh, wants to contact me, I'm always happy to talk more detail about that. Um, so now uh, I think uh, Manoj covered NA very well and the trade-off of, of uh, working distance in NA. So I will skip that. And just briefly for a couple of minutes, I think my time's almost up, but I'll give you a really brief overview, try and keep it to just a few minutes of how we make lenses in an optical factory. So for all of those 17 lenses that you saw, um, inside that objective lens, we start out with a, a wafer of glass that roughly is the diameter of that piece of glass. And you can see that glass, uh, when it's not polished, has kind of this frosted look on the outside. Then we grind it to the rough curvature of the lens itself based on the optical prescription or the, uh, the compu computational design of that lens. Then we smooth that glass and polish it. And that's how you get these nice smooth surfaces. And we do that for every one of those 17 lenses within the uh, complicated objective lens like the one I just showed you. And then we use many different types of uh, techniques, mostly all based on interferometry to look at the uh, curvature and make sure that we got a perfect curved surface on that lens. This is a, a negative blank that we use. Um, basically, it's a test tool for every lens we make. Each lens within an objective, we have to design a test tool that has a very high precision opposite curvature to that. And if you lay those lenses on top of one another, you get what's called Newton's interference rings. And if you get a nice interference ring and you see no waves in those rings, you know that your curvature matches the design specification, okay? Uh, then we do a supersonic washing in a uh, special machine. Then we inspect all the lenses to make sure that there's, there's no, uh, you know, uh, aberration or uh, dust, dirt, anything that got into the glass melt, bubbles, uh, scratches on the surface. And then what we do is we put it in a machine that grinds the outside of the lens so that the optical axis is truly where either the thinnest or thickest point of that lens is and that it's ground perfectly circular around that. 
because when we put all those lenses together in groups and inside the objective, if they're not all on the same optical centering, you're going to end up having uh, terrible aberrations. So all the optical alignment uh, is critical and anyone that works on an optical bench will find that this is the most challenging part of getting your optical bench system to work well is having everything perfectly on axis. So when you're putting lenses in brass tubes, centering them and grinding the outside perfectly is really important. Then we go and we coat them with uh, multi coats or single coats, uh, depending on the type of uh, lens. Uh, what we would like it to transmit with regards to wavelength. And then we cement lenses together in groups, like those achromatic doublets that we spoke about. And the optical cements tend to be cements that are cured in ultraviolet light, uh, which is why ultraviolet light is really not very good for most uh, biological applications, besides the fact that live cells really don't like ultraviolet light and DNA crosslinks and things like that happen. But uh, the optical cement is cured in UV. And if you hit objective lenses that are cemented with short wavelength UV light, they will turn brown and you will get a browning of the surfaces. So you have to be careful about that. Um, we do make lenses for deep ultraviolet light. Those are what they call air gap lenses and they don't have any cements in them. Um, so we then put all of these lenses in groups, in tubes, as you saw in that cutaway. And then each optical group has its own little adjustment tools. Somebody actually sits at a microscope, either looking through it at a laser cross, and they adjust the optical axis so that they're all in alignment. And then when they're in perfect alignment, they seal, they cement these and cut these off and they put them uh, very small lenses inside um, the tube and uh, you're done. Many of the lenses today by all the manufacturers, uh, when you get into these very high-end lenses, like the ones on expensive biological microscopes are really produced by artisans and they're made by hand. And I think that's still true for the major microscope manufacturers, uh, both in Germany and in Japan. And uh, all these different lenses, uh, you know, as I say, they get put into covers, we paint the labels on them and that's it. So sorry, I took a little extra time there, but that's all I have for you. So thank you and uh, sorry to have crammed three lectures into uh, basically one. So if there's any questions, uh, if I still have anyone's attention, I'm happy to uh, address them.